Well, hello, everyone. My name is Terry Swan. I'm the senior pastor here at Salem. We're so glad that you've joined us today. And for those who are on online with us, we're so glad that you're here. So happy Palm Sunday. This is the beginning of Holy Week. And this is a week that we will see a lot of things or we'll hear a lot of things happening in the life of Jesus. He has entered Jerusalem. We have been on a journey, a journey up into this point, right? We've had a lot. We've talked a lot about Jesus's encounters along the way toward Jerusalem as he turned his face toward Jerusalem, and we heard some of those encounters along the way. And he'll have some more this week in this Holy Week. He will um, enter Jerusalem and weep over Jerusalem. He will turn the tables over in the temple um, at. The, the crime that is happening there in God's house. And he will gather the disciples around a table and he'll break bread with them and drink of a cup and promise them and tell them there's a new promise, a new covenant for them. He'll pray in the Garden of Gethsemane to the point that his body sweats drops of blood and he will be arrested, beaten, crucified, put in a tomb, a stone rolled in front of that tomb, and three days later, he is risen. It's a story that guides us, church. It's a story of who we are as those who follow Jesus Christ. It's our journey as well. You know, last week, Pastor Tim was talking about a road trip. He was asked the question about who likes road trips, um, who's here. And I, I noticed I was giggling to myself because um, I had to think about it. I, I, I actually had to think about it. And there were several in the crowd who did the same thing I did. Well, it depends on the road trip, right? And so one of the things that uh, are those of the, you had to think about, I, you know, transportation is really important. There are two things I think that are just very important in a road trip, transportation and the company, the company, the people that you're with. I don't particularly like to take a road trip by myself because I'm just not all that interesting to talk to by myself. You know, I like to have a conversation along the way. There's nobody to share road trip snacks with either. What's your favorite road trip snack out there? Jerk, beef jerky. Beef jerky, okay. Okay. M&M's, there's a woman after my own heart right there. You know, I just I love to share things on a road trip. And, um, and by the same to token, a road trip can be miserable if you're all crammed in a tight vehicle in a van with about 15 youth. I have flashbacks of my youth ministry trips. Uh, Scott, I bet you have some flashbacks of Boy Scouts trips and things like that. And um, a road trip can be wonderful or it can be kind of difficult. A few years ago, our ent entire family took a road trip to Disney. Now, we have a picture of that. Um, we, instead of doing hotels, we decided we were going to rent an RV and we were going to take this road trip together. Now, has anyone here seen the movie RV with the late Robin Williams? If you remember that movie, what was the first thing Robin Williams did after he got into that RV? He backed over what? A mailbox. He backed over a mailbox. So it's like the Swan family took our script right out of that movie because we go to pick up Laura, our oldest, and all of her family, and, she, and Joe backed over her mailbox. <laughs> and so, you know, no damage, no damage to the RV that we were going to have to pay for or anything like that. So that was the beginning of our trip. Holly swears she will never take another road trip in an RV ever again. And Laura and our, some of our other families loved it, great memories. But, you know, it was just time together because it was that time together that mattered. See, we have the disciples, and he is with Jesus with the disciple, and he loved them. They were his companions and his friends. He chose them to take this journey with him, a journey whose purpose many times they did not always understand. Amen? They just didn't understand so many things that he was teaching and talking about. And this journey had its conclusion as 
they entered Jerusalem. They had walked many miles together all the way along, walked all of these miles together. And now Jesus tells the disciples, I need you to go ahead of me and I need you to go get the young colt or the donkey that is tied there. Tell him the master needs it. Now, why in the world would he have walked all of this way and then said, I need a ride into Jerusalem? Well, we're going to talk about that today because for Jesus, transportation mattered at that moment in that time. Will you pray with me? Good and gracious God, wash over us your peace today. Help us to experience your love. May this story come alive in our hearts. And holy God, I pray that you would touch my mind, my lips, my tongue, my voice, especially my heart, oh God, that it might be yours. May the words I proclaim be yours. And I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Jesus' final week begins with this triumphal entry into Jerusalem. It's a celebratory process and a celebratory parade and begins at the top of Mount of Olives and continues down into the Kidron Valley and finally through the Eastern Gate. Now, I have a picture of what that would have looked like in today's time if Jesus was doing that today. This is what he would have seen as he was at the top of of the Mount of Olives. This is looking down over Jerusalem. Now, the four Gospels give us a glimpse of how the church remembers and celebrates Palm Sunday. People join the procession along the way as he made his way down the mountain into Jerusalem. People are welcoming Jesus into the city, this triumphant king, and they are waving palm branches and singing Hosanna, Hosanna, in Hebrew, which means please save. Please save. It's interesting that Luke makes no mention of the palm branches as Sharifa was reading that part of the gospel. However, the other gospels do mention this. The waving of the palms would have been the way you greet a military leader. It goes way back to 150 years before Jesus to Judas Maccabees who threw the Greeks out of Jerusalem, and that event was associated with the waving of palms as a sign of victory. So by combining the story from the other Gospels, we can see that the people were looking for another warrior king, Judas Maccabees. They were looking for that. They were looking for the Messiah. Also, Luke does not tell us how many were gathered. He says it was just a multitude, but Luke's a preacher, And there is something about a preacher's count, church. You ask any preacher how many people were gathered the Sunday before, and they'll say, oh, a multitude. A multitude were gathered. More than likely, there were people along the road, though, and they were joining in and shouting Hosanna and singing along with the disciples. And and, um, Luke spends the bulk of his story focused on this donkey, this young colt as the common English Bible translates it. Why? Why does Luke spend so much of his story on this? It's the fulfillment of a prophecy. If we go to Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9, it says, Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Sing aloud, daughter Jerusalem. Look, your king will come to you. He is righteous and victorious. He is humble and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the offspring of a donkey. He is humble riding on a donkey. This word humble, it's important here. In Greek, it means unassuming, considerate, or meek. But in Hebrew, the word is ani, which means poor and afflicted. As Jacob so beautifully said, In the prayer just a moment ago, Jesus came for the lowest. He came riding the lowest animal of work to show us that he was here for all people. Jesus picks his transportation intentionally. In fact, he enters the city not as everyone 
expected as the one who would lead a revolution. That's what they wanted. They wanted this king that would re- lead this revolution and overcome the Roman butchers, as they called them. Jesus enters as one of humility, love, and peace. Have you ever wondered what Jesus was feeling and thinking as he entered into Jerusalem, as he was riding down that hill and overlooking the city? I've often wondered this. And as I have um, made trips to Israel and I've stood in this place and looked out over the city, I've often wondered what Jesus was thinking, what he was feeling, what he was experiencing, knowing what he was heading toward. And I'm not the only one who's wondered that. Uh, Theologian of a generation ago, Howard Thurman, wrote this. He once said, I wonder what was at work in the mind of Jesus of Nazareth as he jogged along on the back of that faithful donkey. Perhaps his mind was far away to the scenes of his childhood, feeling the sawdust between his toes in his father's shop. He may have been remembering the high holy days in the synagogue with his whole body quickened by the echo of the ram's horn. Or perhaps he was thinking of his mother, how deeply he loved her and how he wished that there had not been laid upon him this great necessity that sent him out onto the open road to proclaim the truth, leaving her side forever. It may be that he lived all over again that high moment on the Sabbath when he was handed the scroll and he unrolled it to the great passage from Isaiah, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me to preach good news to the poor. I wonder what was moving through the mind of the master as he jogged along the back of that faithful donkey. Back when I was in Texas, and I think I'd become commissioned as an elder, my husband bought me this print um, as a gift. There, was, there were two prints at the time, one of Jesus entering Jerusalem and one when he's in the boat with the disciples and they're throwing the nets on the other side. And Joe got me this because I really love the symbolism of this painting, this piece of art. Here Jesus is riding in on, to Jerusalem on this humble beast, showing what kind of king and warrior he is, a warrior of the soul. The doves, the symbolism of the doves also beautiful. What is a symbol of a dove? What does that mean? Anybody? Peace, right. Peace. Jesus enters the city whose name is peace, Jerusalem. Jerusalem is the city of peace. I can imagine as he was going in, wondering, this is going to be any place but peace. Salem, actually, uh, the person who founded Salem, who was a founding pastor, was originally from, um, he was Jewish. He was from Germany, but he was originally Jewish and converted to Christianity. He names Salem, the community of faith, the community of Salem, peace. Peace. Jerusalem, the city of peace. Salem, the church of peace. That is Luke's version of Palm Sunday. He says he came to change the way we live in this world. He came to show us humility, love, and peace. The peace that he came to bring is not the peace that is merely the cessation of hostility. Often when there is cessation of hostility, the people are still in a tanglement, aren't they? They're still estranged from each other. They are just separate so they don't fight anymore. That is not the peace that Jesus came to bring. Peace that the Bible talks about is shalom. It's the peace brought about reconciliation. That's why when Paul emphasizes what it constitutes, 
to be a Christian, it says, God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself and giving to us the ministry of reconciliation. That is the piece that the Bible is talking about. It consists in right relationships. In fact, if we look back over this road trip to Jerusalem, that's what it has all been about, right? It has been about relationship, 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 relationship. Jesus stopped along the way and touched the blind and they could see. He healed those with leprosy and gave them wholeness again. He brought the little children to him to talk to them. He restored life. Over and over again, he fed the hungry, he restored the lost, he brought light into the darkness and life to the dead. And now Jesus was about to complete the ultimate act of reconciliation on the cross. Friday was coming, and there was no turning back now. In fact, when the Pharisees told Jesus he needed to have the disciples quiet down over there, Jesus said to the Pharisees, I tell you, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. In other words, things are set in motion. There's no turning back now. The die's been cast. This is why I have come. Even if you quiet the disciples and the crowd, the rest of the events will take place just as intended just as my father has called me to. This is God's son laying down his life to rescue and reconcile a dying world church. This is God's own son suffering for us, offering us forgiveness and shalom. All that has happened before has brought us to this point. This is what it was all about. The road trip mattered. The transportation at that time mattered. The city, the companions, they all mattered. Just as you matter and I matter in this moment. I'm going to invite the band to come on back up as I tell this closing story. Uh, As I've often mentioned, Family loves dogs, right? You know that we're dog lovers. So I've told dog stories. In fact, in our household, the dogs might just outnumber the people at any one given moment. And so, uh, Simi, who is the Aussie, the, um, my daughter's. Australian Shepherd, she loves to catch the Frisbee, loves to. And as many times as you throw the Frisbee out, she will run to the depths of the yard. She will bring the Frisbee back until she is huffing and puffing like a freight train. She will continue on to catch that Frisbee as many times as you throw it. Now, Penny, my littlest dog, she loves to run after Simmy and pretend that she's catching the Frisbee too. And when Simi is not there, we will throw the Frisbee out a few times, a couple times she'll bring it back. We'll throw the Frisbee out, and then she just kind of puts the Frisbee in her mouth, and she lays there and thinks, looks at you like, well, it's just really not worth it. It's too far. Don't think I'm going to be running back for that. It's just not worth it. Church, I think that's as about as theological as it gets because some of us treat God that way. We think that somehow we're out of reach of God's love, God's grace, and God's peace. We think we have gone too far to come back to God. We've done some things, made some choices. We've failed sin, betrayed ourselves, betrayed someone else. We think that God might be saying, well, that's just not worth it. It's too far. And that is just not true. Because there's no distance too far to come back to God. There is no act, no sin, no betrayal, no choice that God would say is too far to reconcile. As Jesus enters this city... 
he knows full well where this road trip will take him. The cross is an act of love, an act that says how far God will go to remind you and remind me how much he loves us. You matter. And God has gone the distance to show you just how much you matter. God will never say to us, it's not worth it. 